Hey everyone, I want to jump on before you get into the podcast episode today and share that I'm launching the Wise Warrior Mastermind, which I'm really excited about because you know when something comes through me, it comes through with full energy and love. And I really wanted to convene a group, a small group of about five people where we can really go deep and create a safe container, a safe environment, a place where you can just be free, let yourself be you. You don't have to worry about bringing any baggage into the group. And we can really focus on these mindset teachings that I have embodied and learned and mastered over the last several years. And I can share them with you and we can work on them together and we can support each other and create some lasting impact and change in your life. So we can focus on how to lead with love, how to live in flow, how to master your thoughts and what belief systems you have and so many other things that we're going to work on together. So if you're interested, please reach out to me at david at davidkrichards.com, or you can go to the website, davidkrichards.com slash program slash mindset. We're going to get better together. We're going to learn, we're going to grow, and it's going to be a, a small number of us. So if you're interested, please reach out as soon as possible because we don't have that many spaces. All right. Enjoy, enjoy today's episode. Thanks. American microschooling is one of the most exciting, dynamic, diversified, fastest growing movements we've seen in American education in generations. It looks differently in different places. And we just love to help people launch micro schools to, that live up to their own potential and their own vision. All right. Thank you, Don. Yeah. So Don and I just had a great conversation. And like he said, he is championing the micro school movement through his center. And we talk a lot about what makes a micro school unique. How do you fund a micro school? What is a micro school? Where do we think the micro school movement is going to go in 30 years? So it's a real comprehensive conversation. Don has deep expertise in education reform. We both share kind of spending several years in charter schools and understanding that this is an amazing moment for micro schools. And I will share his the link to his website. And he has some great articles that are being published in the national press now. And so it's a really exciting time. And I was excited to have Don on because he's super passionate super knowledgeable, and he wants to build a movement, connect people, and I think you'll really enjoy our conversation. Our conversation. So thanks so much, Don. All right, welcome everyone. I'm excited today to be here with Don Soifer. Welcome, Don. How are you? Great, David. How are you? Awesome, awesome. Excited to be with you. I wanted to start by just kind of giving the listeners a little background on your bio. So I'm going to read your kind of a shortened version of your bio, and then, and then I'm going to ask you a question to kind of get us going in this conversation. So Don Soifer is Chief Executive Off Officer of the National Microschooling Center. He co-created and co-directed the Southern Nevada Urban Micro Academy, the nation's first public-private partnership micro school with the city of North Las Vegas. I really want to hear about that. Prior to opening the center, he was president of Nevada Action for School Options. He previously served as executive vice president of the Lexington Institute, a nonpartisan think tank in Arlington, Virginia, that he co-founded in 1998. He earned a record as one of the nation's most accomplished charter school authorizers, serving an unprecedented three mayor-appointed council-confirmed terms on the District of Columbia Public Charter School Board beginning in 2008. He subsequently served as a board member on the Nevada State Public Charter School Authority, appointed by the State Board of Education from 2019 to 2021. So you can see why I wanted to have Don on, because he has a wealth of experience. He's been around the charter space. He's been around reform and done all these interesting things. So we have some similar uh, you know, things we've done in the past, and we both are very excited about micro-schooling, which is why I wanted to have him on to hear where he sees all this from the center and why he started. So I wanted to start with that question. How did you end up going from charter schools and state board of education into micro schools and then launching this amazing center that you're working on? Well, David, David, thanks. It's uh, it's great to be talking with you. And I, uh, we both come from, from the innovative charter school space and yeah. was in it for a long time. And in the beginning of the, those days, we had some, life-changing phenomenal educators meeting in church basements trying to figure yes. out how to work together to solve challenges and and uh launch some pretty some pretty great learning opportunities for kids and anyone that worked with me in in, in the, that space in the different states that i worked i was always pushing the envelope i was always dissatisfied with where we were and impatient with why can't we do do more to help more you know sooner and and yes. uh 
What about our kids that can't wait 24 years for us to get everybody yes. up to where we say their opportunities can be? We have that in common. I appreciate yeah. you for that. <laughs> that, that. That reform fatigue is, is real. Yeah. And I was an education researcher by background, so I felt like we know what education research has to tell us. We're learning new things from time to time, but by and large, let's go ahead and do it. So yeah, yeah um, I moved out to, to Nevada after, um, you know, sort of in, in, mid, in mid-career based on the East Coast. I'd never lived in the West. And I... Um, got some people behind me to launch a next generation action tank. Like, let's go ahead and do this stuff that we've been writing and talking about. Yeah. And then the pandemic hit about a year or so later. And I, I'm sir, I'm in Southern Nevada. We have the fifth largest school district in the country. I was in talking with the mayor and the leadership of the city of North Las Vegas, the poorest, hardest working, fastest growing city in Nevada. Yep. And the fifth largest school district in the country was just going to shut down and not be there for their residents and the charter mm-hmm. school sector as well. And there are no non-public schools really serving North Las Vegas. So what are we going to do? So yeah. I've always loved the idea of, of micro schools. I've, 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 I've known many, written written about lots, tried to get, we did get Wildflower approved in, in D.C. And, and I was always sort of skeptical that the rigidities of the charter school governance model were going to allow the sort of innovation that we know is possible. Right. In micro school. And, and David, from your background in the personalized learning world, we can do, we know what's possible. And with personalized learning, you can blow the doors off expectations for yep. learning growth or even non-academic growth in so many important ways. So I knew what we wanted to do. I, I uh, we, My chief of staff and I uh, worked through the night, dropped two briefing books on the city manager's desk the next morning, worked with some great national partners and some some folks from the ed tech world. And we, we created micro schools in person every day during the pandemic in North Las Vegas serving kids three quarters of our kids when we assessed them were more than two grade levels behind we knew that that was the kids we wanted to walk in the door because that's yeah. what's north las vegas and we rocked it out i worked with the rand corporation we did a case study and our kids averaged two years of academic gains in math and sort of in the same ballpark and reading in year one in the middle of the pandemic where we were there every day with you know following all of the you know we, we followed all of the the, the rules and guidances and masks yeah. and um, and it was a phenomenal experience, and none of those one, none of those families wanted to go back. And we were really, in effect, te- you know, competing with kids being left home alone with a jar of peanut butter, right? Yes. Degrees of urban poverty. We had them all. And suddenly, we had two dozen micro school leaders meeting in our office on Thursday night to learn how to do this. So um, we started. We developed some training programs. The beauty of it, and and I'll, I'll get off this soapbox in a second, but. We had some 20-year veteran world-class educators on our team, but we also had people with totally different backgrounds. If you've ever taught, uh, for those of you who out there who've taught middle school math, right? It's mm-hmm. uh, it, under the Common Core. It's it's challenging, right? As a parent of middle schoolers, oh, yeah. um, But our star middle school math te- math teacher, Mr. Levi, was the guy who leads pyrotechnics at the Knights of the Round Table show at the Excalibur Casino, the guy who blows stuff up for a living, was absolutely incredible at teaching middle school common core math. Wow. And we, it was a management exercise. We, we had a really great team. And, and you can do this. So, so we started getting calls from people around the country. Where is there a micro school that I can join? And we started having to tell people, you know, maybe you get lucky and there's one, but this is a thing you can do. This is a thing you can build. This is millions of the families of america the families of millions of american learners who are just reclaiming control of their children's education trajectory yes. themselves in meaningful ways and we're we're movement builders and i love every part of this work and it's because of those those same people who are the lifeblood of this movement yes oh my gosh so much great information and so i didn't realize it came out of the pandemic but i i love that that's it makes perfect sense in terms of you know you running micro school and so, okay, so what I love about this is it reminds me of the early days of the charter school movement, right? The charter school legislation, the original one in California, I'm in California, was all about being an incubator of innovation, right? So like the early days of Summit Public Schools, we were trying all these new things and everyone was kind of, you know, not leaving us alone, but there wasn't a lot of people saying like, this is this is wrong. You know, we were really innovating, doing interesting things. And as time went on, it became more and more regulated, more and more bureaucratic and we could, we, it was less and less that we could do that really. We felt like we were serving kids. So I love what you're saying around it's giving people the flexibility to do what they think is best for kids. And what is it about the micro school? I mean, that allows people that flexibility is, you know, are there regulations? Cause I don't know if people really understand, is it a homeschool? Is it a micro school? You know, because some people might think like, well, we can't just let people go crazy and, and just do whatever they want with kids. You know, what, what is it about micro schools that 
Are, is there any regulation? Like, how does that work? Sure. And there, there's there's lots there to unpack. So let me just yeah. start by saying this looks different in different places. And right. the, the beauty of a micro school, I mean, small is great if you're like Clark County, Nevada, and you've got 37 chairs in an eighth grade classroom, you are 34 chairs in an eighth grade classroom and 37 kids. Right. So yeah. small is, is wonderful in lots of ways, and especially for the educators. Right. Because this is about thriving for educators as well as it is for, yes. for kids. It can look very different in, in different spaces, but to me, the, what's really exciting about it from a pedagogical sense um, in terms of teaching and learning is that you really can design micro schools around the needs of the particular learners that you're serving in ways that the charter world that we both come from has evolved to a place that's about identifying and replicating and yeah. repeating, which, yeah. which has a quality control uh, you know, that, that, that works for lots of families. But micro school families, know that you can it's this is relationship based this is community based so that micro school families and and they can they're diversified in every way micro schools across america are diversified from the leader and the background of the leader and the families i mean there's there are probably more on the left than there are on the right these are families that simply don't recognize that their state academic content standards are what's going to best prepare their child for the future that their child is is going to need to have um, they have diverse um, missions for those reasons. We have micro schools that have about half of micro schools have specialized learning approaches, whether they be nature and ecology to um, you know a, a workplace work workplace preparation to you know lots of you know to Montessori to Waldorf. There's lots of different packages that are put together, and also the schedule. So depending on the state that you're in, um, people organize micro schools either as learning centers that serve families under the homeschool laws. And these are usually not traditional homeschoolers. What we did in North Las Vegas, I was at the press conference when the mayor was announcing this program that um, in a high poverty city that he made free with, with city dollars outside of education dollars, free for every resident, free breakfast, free lunch, full time every day. Um, but he required that families withdraw from the school district and register as homeschoolers because we were following the homeschool law. Everything we were mm -hmm. doing was aligned with state content standards. Right. But that was the way that it made sense in that, you know, to set up. In some states, um, you can have, uh, you, it's it's not difficult to set up as a private school, whether accredited or unaccredited. Right. And we can talk about accreditation, right? Anyone that's ever been through that process finds it hard to recognize that that expensive, cumbersome process actually lets you come out of Absolutely. it serving kids better. But there are ways to, you know, and also micro schools want to be able to innovate, want to be able to evolve, want to be able yep. to iterate in lots of ways. So they look differently in different states. There are some states like Maryland comes to mind or New York that have incredibly regulated private school sectors where it just is, makes more sense to serve under the homeschool laws. And in those states, to answer okay. the question, those families are observe the homeschool laws in their state. There are sort of two groups here. There are, I mean, we love our micro school families and we're movement builders. So this is all about that. Yeah. As much in the blue states and the purple states as the red states. The red states have school choice right now. So the question then becomes, what is it that can get micro schools access to school choice programs as seamlessly as possible, but, but in ways that they don't need to compromise those flexibilities that makes families love them? And that's one important set of questions going on right now. Right. On the other hand, we have micro school families in states that are never going to see school choice dollars, probably the state that, that you live in is is is, a, is is an example of that. Yes. So these are families that that and, and a lot of these these are those same life changing educators that you and I were with in, in church basements in the start yes. of the charter school movement, and they say things like, "I got tired of having to kick my classroom door closed so I can teach the way my families really need." Absolutely. To and there is that lifeblood in it that's so exciting. And how do we keep them out of harm's way from regulators who just the regulatory structures in most states just never really anticipated this. We talk about microschooling like it's this new and sexy thing, where in fact, like the 1863 model of microschool is incredibly popular in this country, and for good reason, just yeah. updating with what we now know about pedagogy and teaching and learning and baby technology. Yes. That said, how do we, you know, these are this is something that the regulatory structure for education had not really anticipated let alone the regulatory structure for business license and zoning and land use and childcare, lots of these. So, so, so the center is very actively sort of in there doing our best to keep good people out of harm's way and to yes. evolve regulatory programs. So it does look different in every state. Okay. And I'd love to give you particular examples, but it really, that's part of the beauty of this many flowers bloom movement. Yeah. And that's what I love that, you know, I love that you have the center to kind of connects all the dots here. And I, I'm on your email list and I saw that you shared, you know, there's a Wall Street Journal article and 
another national press article. And it's really interesting to see. So I remember I told you before we hit record that when I was launching my, when I was planning my charter school, the one I have now, Growth Public Schools, which is just about to be a K through eight in Sacramento, we were, I had two years to plan. So this would have been 2015. And I remember thinking, what are like the most innovative schools around? And I started asking people and I said, have you heard of Acton Academy? And I was like, let me check this place out. So I went and looked at it. And at that point, they were only in Austin, you know, it was 2015. I think they've been open for five years in Austin. And I was like, wow, this is what I would love. Some version of this is what I would love to do with kids. And as the planning went on and on, the vision, I was just so, I was so inspired. I was just excited. I was like, oh gosh, you know, like Summit was great, but we started getting into like, like you said, replicating and scaling and, you know, centralizing and all that stuff that kind of is harder to do really interesting, innovative things. So I was like, I'm going to do this great thing. And then as I got through the charter approval process, it just got more and more diluted. And so I feel like as the time has passed over the last five years and we had the pandemic and it seems like there's an opportunity here to start these, all these different types of micro schools. So I love that you're showing us all the different kinds that there are just like the charter movement. People ask me, are charter schools good or bad? I say, well, it's like asking me if cars are good or bad. It depends. Is it a Ford? Is it a Toyota? You know, so yeah. the, it depends on where you are, where the industry, you know, where, what area you're in. And so with micro schools, they're going to be really different and similar to any kind of mission, right? Someone's going to have a certain mission. Like you said, maybe it's Montessori, maybe it's smaller. Well, they're all smaller. Um, but what is it about the micro schools that make them unique compared to maybe like a, a larger school district of a parent saying like, why would I want to go to a school with 50 kids? Oh, that's another question. How many are there? How many, how many kids are in a micro school? Is it 20? Is it a hundred? So um, those two questions, how many in a micro school and what makes them unique? Great. Well, we find the median is about 12 kids okay. and they tend to start small, like a charter school it tends to start small, build, establish a culture. And then in year two, you start to grow and fill the number of, of seats that you have. But Unlike a charter school network where there are economies of scale, micro schools don't really have an incentive to grow terribly large. Sometimes right. people will open up other campuses, but this is they're, 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 there's not really incentives to grow, grow, grow like there are on, in charter schools. I, I love that. Let's go back to your example of Montessori for a second, right? So, yeah. so often in this case, these are these really are inspiring educators and they're doing things that you just simply couldn't do in other sectors of schools of choice, take a small Montessori, uh, you know, non-public school, right? Because because Montessori, for Montessori, for those that are that are steeped in the spirit of Maria and what this is all about, yeah, recognize that if you want to be a Montessori and you want to be a charter school, you need to make some compromises in the yeah. teaching, learning, and in the values, and to do it on a small scale, especially in states where. There are seat time requirements and 30 square feet per kid and licensed administrators. You, you compromise something so that you really couldn't do that the way that these families envision the modern day uh, you know, example of, of the work of Maria Montessori. Um, truly child-centered learning environments. The Institute for Child-Centered Learning out of Atlanta does fascinating work. And to be a truly child-centered learning environment and our own children were, were in a, a child-centered micro school um, for the past two years. And it's mm -hmm. funny, you think, oh, they're just going to play games. What, what are they going to get out of it? And then right. they were coming home every day, they didn't have time to eat their lunch, you know, because they're so caught up in what they're doing because of these <laughs> yes. two absolutely inspired founders. So, um, and they you know, likewise, a Montessori school that we had here was able to get cheap furniture because, because in Arizona, which we all sort of talk about as the, as the golden place for school choice, the the regulators who handle food provision don't like the idea of Montessori, where a little child comes in and makes you a thimble full of tea and hands it off. And and it became so untenable to do a true Montessori model in the state of Arizona that she had to close. This wonderful woman mm. had to close. So this is in many cases about doing something that you just couldn't really realize to its potential in other in other spaces and mm -hmm. and how to navigate that in, in different in different settings and in in the early days of the charter school world where we had charter schools and rope factories in Worcester, Massachusetts. Yep. The schools are in storefronts and and all sorts of interesting yeah. arrangements. And that's that's the that's the spirit of the thing. Yeah. And I love the keeping it small. So I remember when I was first coming into education and I spent a lot of time reading the, uh, working with the coalition of essential schools, which their right. whole thing was like small schools, right? Like 200 schools max for a high school, 200 kids max for a high school. 
And I remember when I was running my high schools and we did 400 kids, hundred per grade, right? Which is like considered a smaller high school in the normal world, maybe not in a micro school, right? But but then I remember that first year we'd do hundred and then we would grow slowly, right? So we'd go to 400 over four years. And I remember every year it got more and more complicated and we got more and more disconnected. And we had to work so hard to know all the kids' names and like keep the ethos of, you know, every student is, is known. And so I love, love this smaller unit because I think about all of the issues that you deal with in schools. My kids are currently in, you know, traditional public schools where they're pretty big. And, you know, my son's in the middle school with a thousand kids and and a couple administrators and a counselor and their job is so incredibly difficult. Like they've now done two lunches to minimize fights. And I'm thinking, okay, that's kind of irritating to me because my son now doesn't see half of his friends, but I put myself in their shoes and I think, well, yeah, there's a thousand kids at lunch and it's middle school and there's the teachers are in their classrooms. There's three adults. Right. And so the, just simplifying this down to a smaller unit, you did, like you said, the facilities piece, you can, that's simpler. Like the teachers can be more on the ground. You don't have to have 42 administrators. Like everything is simpler. And so I love that so much now, but what people always ask me is like, well, how do I fund it? So again, if you're not in a state that has these um, vouchers or some sort of funding tax credits, whatever, like California, where I am now, how do we fund this? And how do we ensure this is equitable and accessible to all? Because the other thing I get is like, oh, So this is one of those, um, you know, where I'm going, (laughs) this is one of those elite, you know, the affluent, the 1% are now, uh, you know, siphoning more money from the public, public schools and taking their kids into the learning pods and all that kind of, um, that stuff. But yeah. So what, what do you think about all that? Yeah. So equitable access, how do we make sure that these are there for the families that need the most in the States that don't have school choice? And yeah, I'm going to turn this into a school choice commercial, but we all want to serve the kids who need us most. So yeah. being creative on both sides of the ledger is really important. So a micro school, first of all, doesn't need to be a 25 or $100 million building like our like our charter schools are, or, yeah. or $200 million buildings, right? Yeah. That's hard to find in the charter school world. Yeah. Um, a micro school, and, and they can be in a, in a you know, commercial lease in a, in a storefront space. The, the, the startup to a micro school, we, we launched ours for 100 kids in about two weeks. So we're, we're in, in the charter school world. We have, an, an, you know, the mindset that about 18 months is the right amount. Right, yeah. To well, how then, many, uh, what grade levels was that? Yeah. So we served grades one through eight. Okay. Um, cool. K, K was, I was intimidated to do K on a short fuse. Like you can be thoughtful about it, but, <laughs> yes. um, you know, don't get the screen, right? Is, yeah. is, you know, um, so, so how do we, so, so being creative on both sides of the ledger, and that's something the National Micro Schooling Center, we're a nonprofit. We don't charge our we don't charge micro schools anything to help them with. And we help them sort of navigate these things. And if you can find facilities, and, and there are different ways to do that to take the expense of that off the board. So yeah. partnership micro schools like we had, where we had the city um, who was the host partner who provided um, you know, the space and the rec centers and libraries that they owned, and they were able to help us navigate free breakfast and lunch. And right. the city, and by the way, has an IT department. So thank you very much. I'd love to put your IT department to work. Yes. Um, so, and, and host partners around the country can be houses of worship. They can be um, employers, you know, family-friendly employers who want to do something for their own families. They can be professional associations. This can look lots of ways. We're doing a project yes. with a, a rural public library. They have the space. So okay. you no longer need to solve that. Teaching and learning tools, this is the golden age of digital content. So computers are not for oh, everybody. But absolutely. We, the center loves, we, we actually, I, I, I got an unexpected national grant last year and we used it pretty much all for learning tools to buy bulk contracts of every of every learning tool that we had requests for so that we could then turn around and give it to micro schools or give it to micro schools at the, at the low bulk rate cost and then just put every dollar we got back into and buying into buying new ones. I so, love that you do that. I saw that in your newsletter and I was so excited by that because you're taking away, like, again, you're just taking away another obstacle, right? So that they don't have to go searching and they can do what they do best. They can go right to you and say like, Hey, oh my gosh, tell me, can I find a group of people? Like I know you have your affinity groups. Can I find a group of people that have used X, Y, Z curriculum or whatever? And what do they think about it? And it's just, it's, I love that you're doing that. It's amazing. And in the charter school world, if you want to make a curricular change, you at the very least have to get approval and probably have to wait till the next school year to do it. If, if you know, seventh grade math isn't going all that well, and you thought that the kids were going to respond really well to 
ST math, not to pick on them. I love the little penguin, right? But but if your kids are not responding to the yeah. math that you thought was going to make sense, you don't need to wait until next year to make the switch. We help people do that. So so back to your question about equitable access. Yes. At this point, we just need to get the get the educator paid, right? And a lot of, you know, sometimes if they have their own children in the micro school, that helps us too. We have micro school, you know, we find that it, it the, the startup costs, if you have to get a commercial lease, right? So you probably would then need to put two months of the lease, you know, the first and last months of the commercial lease, yeah. um, insurance, which we encourage everybody to get the basic startup. So we're probably yeah. talking between fifteen and $25,000 in startup costs all in. Yeah. Um, and that includes, you know, paying yourself something so you can you can you can do this. Yeah. Um, whereas the charter school world, we're used to having somebody on payroll for a year before the oh, charter yeah. school ever even, op even opens, which not to knock that, that works fine for a lot of people. So uh, what happens there? We have that, that becomes families who people who can borrow that much money from family and friends. Right. Which is a somewhat self, you know, that that's one particular group of people. Yeah. We have amazing educators who. I hate I hate to see people liquidate the 401ks, but it's a thing that we've seen micro school leaders do to, yeah. to, to solve it. So so we're trying to do some interesting stuff to figure out what are some um, like revolving loan fund models that we can do to help people over that initial hurdle. Um, but and then philanthropy gradually is coming around to micro schooling, which gets you to another question. We're used to relying on school performance frameworks based around performance on the state, the an, based on annual performance on the state test. Micro schools measure their impact in lots of creative ways, which I love. And what are the ways that for stakeholders, most important ones, of course, being the family, but if other people are involved too, like we had to promise the city of North Las Vegas, we would accomplish 125% of the academic learning gains of the schools that the kids were coming to us from. Hmm. And we were able to, you know, we worked with the Rand Corporation to establish how, how we could do that. Yes. So, so being creative on both sides of the ledger is important. And then 85, 90% of micro schools are tuition based. So um, again, we do micro schools, I find, are particularly popular in neurodiverse communities and yep. particularly po uh, you know, um, popular at the, frankly, the more fragile ends of the income spectrum yep. where families are less confident that the public school system is going to prepare their kid for the future that they're going to have, not the future that we had when we were that kid. <laughs> so yeah. um, it, it does take being creative. And these are, this is the early adoption phase. This is, there's yes. no one right way to, to get this and there's no wrong way to do it. Um, but we, we uh, we're all exploring this together. And I kind of think that, I mean, I, I, I just, when I think I've seen it all, I, I come across somebody with a really, really cool new innovative, yeah. um, the, the organization out school, who you might be familiar with, mm -hmm. who yeah. I love as a parent is looking at microschooling in some altogether different ways that could really push the, you know, push, push the expectation for what innovation is the way Summit and Diane Taverner did, right? It, this is all exciting cross-pollinization stuff. Yeah. I'm getting so fired up right now. <laughs> I love what you talked about because I, what I'm hearing you say is that you're, you're not just like, well, here's the formula for how we fund a micro school. What you're saying is it's a challenge and there's multiple solutions and there are many people that are working on different solutions. And, you know, I have a, one of my friends, I helped her open a micro school right outside of the Native American reservation that she grew up in because she was working on the reservation and she felt like it wasn't really serving the kids and it was, she was just scratching her head and really struggling. So she decided to open a small micro school, literally just right outside. And she's able to get funding through the federal government because, you know, it's 95% Native American students. So again, so many unique situations, so many unique options. I know, and if you're in some states, like it's much simpler than others, right? Based on the legislation and the funding models. And I've seen the um, sliding scale models in some of the schools in California. So I feel like, well, the reason I'm getting fired up right now is because what you're saying is you're going to get a lot of smart people together. You're a movement builder. You like to hold the space and get them connected and talk to the funders and you're going to help them find solutions. And five, 10 years down the road, you're going to be saying, when someone asks you, how do you fund a micro school for everyone? You're going to say, oh, well, here, here's some ways that we've seen it be really successful. And we're continuing to ask the smart people that work with kids every day that are trying to build what they dream about. And that's the other piece. These people are really passionate. I remember a Facebook post I put up for my charter school 10 years, um, eight years ago, where I said, who literally puts themselves seventy thousand dollars in debt on their credit line to start a nonprofit? Right, and that was one of my most responded Facebook posts. Everyone's like, "What are you doing? That's crazy! Like, why are you doing that?" And I was just doing that to for cash flow. Like, the funding was coming, but 
that those are the types of people that you're dealing with. It sounds like in the micro school movement, people that are really passionate and saying like, Hey, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get my community together. This is what is so important for my kids and, and they're going to do it and they're going to find a way. Yeah. We did a, a sector analysis last year, our first one, the American micro schooling sector analysis. It's on. Oh, I love that. I'm glad you brought it up. I wanted to ask about that. Yeah. And, it was and, very helpful for me as, as a reader. Really, really helpful. Like seeing that so many um, founders that are coming up, it's much more diverse ethnically and racially. Just seeing that was so helpful for me. But go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> great. Great. And I just wanted to draw one of my favorite examples from that. We talk about these like they're entrepreneurs as if, you know, if 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 bringing, bringing, in, bringing in dollars is their primary motivation. So we asked micro school founders mm. what their main motivations were. And the top two were one is is bringing options to historically marginalized and underserved communities, and you know, and micro schooling found you know, we we struggle in in schools of choice to have leadership opportunities for leaders of color. Yeah, um, and, and I, I happen to be in a state where there was one black charter school leader and 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 two black private school owners who are married to each other, and they're wonderful, right? But our micro schooling sector really looks like the population that we're serving. Yes, um, broadly and in, 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 in every way. So, so, um, and then the second one was helping, um, giving kids an opportunity to thrive where they had not thrived previously. Thriving, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Michelle Borba's book Thrivers is one that, that's important, I think, to me and to yeah. the micro space. And and ha these are this is the sort of leaders that we have that help each other solve problems. We'll we'll work with each other to you know siblings are real. We have about twenty five micro schools within about within about ten miles here in, in Las Vegas, and. You know, something that in the charter school space I remembered was that we started evaluating charter schools on the re-enrollment rates that they had. And, yeah. and that made sense uh, and does make sense yeah. to a lot of leaders in that space. Whereas in micro schooling, you know, you, well, people don't leave a charter school, a high performing charter school to go to a different one because they're a wait list and they'll lose their spot. It just doesn't yeah. happen. And, yeah. and where micro schools, people can go into a different micro school or you want to move over here where the math program is strong or they've got a strong again, nature and ecology focus or what have you, um, our siblings can move around a lot. And that's part of the fabric of this is, we have, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a student of civil rights history. And in our office, every room in our office, we have a, a, a portrait of uh, Ella Baker, the civil rights pioneer, mm, yeah. looking down on this, who, who says you, you can't organize people unless you know them and listen to them and understand mm. where they're coming from. And that's the movement building approach that we try to take at the center. Yeah. I also love the opportunity for teachers. So one of the things that I got a lot of phone calls during the pandemic around, like, what do you think about this whole pod thing? Right. And it's like, you know, and my kind of knee jerk response was I'm concerned if it's only families that can afford to hire, you know, $80,000 teacher for their five kids. Like, but what I saw is that, that it evolved and it was not just that, but what I would always say is like, I think it's a great idea, you know, as long as you're not just making it for the elite people that, you know, and leaving the 99% out. But what I saw throughout the process was that the families were super engaged and it gave an opportunity for the teacher. So I really love this idea of if you're a teacher, that's just kind of like, I'm not thriving in this system. You know, the 37 kids, I started my career in Oakland public schools, right? With the kids standing around the walls, you know, 58 kids and 42 seats and all that. And, and I was not able to thrive there. I did pretty well and but I wasn't able to thrive there so if you're a teacher that's like I'm not thriving in the current system there's a there's a place for you in a micro school and if you're an entrepreneurial teacher like you said the ones that we started out with in the church basements and the charter school movement if you're one of those teachers there's a place for you and if you're excited about saying hey the teacher that I met that I said that I helped open a school she was a teacher for a long time then a principal and she had wanted to start her own school for 10 years. And then we met and I said, great, let's do it. And so I feel like there's a place for teachers to work within the micro school system to start their own. And it just, it gives me hope for the teachers that maybe would leave the profession that now have a space to thrive. That's absolutely right. Catch people, catch teachers when they feel like they need to leave the classroom, but before they leave the profession. And Yes. We're a nonprofit. We help people launch micro schools, and there's no part of this that we can't help help you with. And there, yeah. are, there at this point, there are good there are good people that that have some pretty good ways to help. Yeah, yeah. What is one story 
that's really inspiring from a micro school across the country, like either a founder or a student or something that just really you love to share with people that maybe we don't know about? Yeah. So um, early on in uh, when West Virginia was passing the Hope Scholarship Program, um, we spent a fair bit of time in, in West Virginia. And these are communities where you couldn't stay home and be a homeschooler and have robust broadband enough to be able to do an online program, right? The, 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 the infrastructure just isn't there to do it. So some of the great people that are launching micro schools, whether it be urban West Virginia or um, you know, like, like Charleston or South Charleston or um, Huntington, West Virginia, where we have a terrific micro school um, that is sort of ground zero of the opioid academic um, world. And this is a this is a faith based school, a, a, um, a um, charismatic Christian church, where they've got a, a large international population in their in their congregation, and the families that they serve, and launched micro schools there. And it was actually there is a school choice program now, and now it's up and going. But it was very awkward to what's a micro school? How does this even fit in? What's going on? The, you know, we had to work with the legislature to actually then define in law what this entity was and what it could be. And now they're up and running and they've doubled every year in mm. a place where, you know, the story that I would hear more often than not in Huntington is uh, a, a parent walks into the school, puts a wad of cash in their kid's backpack because the, the, the law enforcement agency is not going to search the kid. Yeah, and what they're doing is inspiring, and we get more and more calls. We just talked to a really great organization that's going to do a recovery high school, a micro school uh, in Huntington, which is exciting. Okay. So, and yeah. these are places like Las Vegas. No one, no one was coming to Las Vegas to see the innovative education that was going on before the micro school world, and now we have national groups coming every month. It's exciting to see. I'd love to come visit. I did go on a tour last year with Opportunity One Eighty around when we were thinking about replicating our charter school in, in Nevada, but I learned so much by going on the school tours and talking to them. But so yeah, we can talk about that. But <laughs> um, that. another question is, I think we'll have a couple more and they're going to wrap up. So one of the, actually let's make this one of the last questions. So I feel very strongly and I felt this way before the pandemic that education is going to change because of the people on the ground. Because I mean, like you said, the civil rights movement, right? The policy will change, but it's going to start with the people on the ground. It's going to be the grassroots. It's going to be the parents that care the most about their kids, the teachers that care so deeply about their kids, people like you and me that have been around for a while that care so deeply about change and innovation. So where do you see this micro school movement going? And I can say in five years, I feel like it's accelerated. I was like, wow, this is just picking up quickly. Where do you see it like, you know, 10, 20, 30 years now or from now in the future? Yeah. I don't know if this movement is ever going to supplant the public education system. I mean, the, the draw of Friday night lights is big. Um, right. We're at about a 2% market share right now, if you follow, if you believe the, the research and it's hard to track, right? Because definitions are different in every jurisdiction. And, and so many people have been doing this for a really long time. Every week we hear from, from somebody in South Chicago that's been doing this for 25 years that just yeah. doesn't really raise their head, raise their hand very often because they don't have an advantage in doing it. Yeah. But if we're at about, you know, over a million kids, and which is about roughly where Catholic schools are in this country in terms of market share, about 2%. It yeah. wouldn't surprise me at all to see this sector get in the near term close to 10%. And, and these are, again, not traditional homeschool families. These are families that come from much more traditional settings. Yeah. And maybe they're only going to do it temporarily. Maybe they have a bullying problem. Maybe they have a fifth grade teacher that they don't get along with or the family wants to travel. And they're going to go back to play linebacker or tuba or what have you. Yeah. It's a different, it's, it's a, it, it is a very different thing than we've seen in other sectors. But, and, and again, not to not Catholic education, right? Because I feel like Catholic microschooling is an important part of the growth. You right. look at what I have a ton, one of my education heroes is Paula Scala, the superintendent of the Los Angeles Archdiocese. And what they're Oh, doing, I know him. Yeah, he's great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He was I, in the um, New Schools Venture Fund cohort with me when he was working in the Central Valley. So I got to know him pretty well. Yeah. Serving serving the kids of migrant workers. Yep. Great guy. School. And Paul grew up poor in that diocese and wants to make sure that he's serving all of the families who need him. So there really is a lot of potential in, in you know, or, or, or Catholic, uh, you know, rural places where there's not enough kids to be a Catholic school, but there are churches with two or three classrooms. Nice. So I do think that that's part of it, not to knock that community at, at all. They did a great job during the pandemic overall. So I think that 
uh, I'm a, I'm a I'm a hopeless wonk, right? So to me, this the the, the parallel that I that I draw is the early days of venture capital as an industry, where the Securities and Exchange Commission was required to regulate something that was patently illegal. Wait, this the investors are going to get together and force and have a seat on the board? That that they would just, but they ended up realizing which way the wind is blowing, and they just changed the whole apparatus of regulation mm -hmm. to accommodate something that was increasingly popular. And and you know, it's hard to imagine commerce today without venture capital. Yeah, my feeling is is getting to the point where as mainstream families or families that are known to their lawmakers left right and center not just the you know the traditional school choice crowd that showed up every two years for their free money and and they deserve those opportunities i don't mean to knock them in any way but yeah. this is a broader base and and it's an exciting base and i don't know what the future for instance of public school accountability is in this country frankly i'm not very bullish on what that could look like. People are tired of teaching me the test. So yeah. micro schools and their innovative ways of measuring impact and, and having impact, I think are just be, you know, gonna grow and become more and more popular. Yeah. And it reminds me of what we talked a lot about at Summit with you know Clayton Christensen and disruptive innovation and thinking about how do you end up with the big system being changed by the small system, right? And so I feel like that's, it's a place and you, you've mentioned it several times, like innovation, innovating around curriculum, innovating around this, innovating around that. It's, it's a place where you can say, Hey, these things are possible when you get passionate groups of people together and it starts to, and you said it takes two weeks, right. Instead of, and we were comparing like charter school and micro school, but we didn't even go into the traditional school versus, I mean, my daughter's school, half the teachers just left they, you know, everyone's been there for 25 years. They all left to go do the school of innovation in the district. Well, it took them five years to decide that they were going to have a, the innovative school. Then it took them another two years to decide who was going to be on the team. And now they're spending three years to plan it. So 10 years to create a K-8 innovative school in the district. So the fact that you can do a micro school in two weeks or a few months, that allows for so much exciting innovation. And like you said, the adaptability, the fact that you can be nimble, you can test, you can try, do what's best for kids, like always holding that. What is best for the kids right now, right here? And then you have a small unit. So you can easily adapt quickly. So I love it. I love it. I love it. And I love your, the way you're seeing the future. And I think that I totally agree with you. I think it's going to keep growing. I think that the pandemic showed parents what's going on inside classrooms and that's starting to make them really wonder. We have a changing world of technology. So totally agree with you. I'm excited to keep track of it. I'm excited about the work you're doing so that we have somebody with so much passion that championing this movement and so excited to have you on today. Is there any other, um, you know, closing thoughts or anything you wish you would have said before we close out here? No, David, thanks. We're we're movement builders. We help people launch micro schools. So microschoolingcenter.org, microschoolingcenter.org. We fill out a quick form just so we know where you are and what ages you're interested in and how we can help you. And one of our team members will reach out and there's no one way this needs to look. So we can help people connect and, and ecosystem building is important. It's great to have a few micro schools within driving distance so you can learn together and yes. from each other. And we've got fantastic bases for micro schooling in unlikely places around the country. I love the Fort Lauderdale micro schools or the Atlanta area micro schools, places where civil rights was, you know, was launched. Yeah. Um, so, so this is, this is, we love it. And, and, but we don't know the answers that the best micro schools, the most innovative micro schools are going to be ones we haven't conceived of yet. So, so yes. that's why I sit in such an exciting seat. Awesome. Well, I knew this would not disappoint and it definitely didn't. So thanks again, Don, for a great conversation. It's a pleasure, David. Thanks.